I'm just I'm really excited to be here to get to talk to you about story to tell and to tell some of the stories because the story started right here. Yeah. Yeah. This is amazing, man. You know, <laughs> I got a sneak preview of the project, which I am absolutely blown away. Um, but I really want you to kind of explain, you know, I know how you got here today. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how did you get here? Like as in J period. I'm honestly trying to figure out how I got here myself. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I told you about this amazing night a week ago where I, I found myself in the room with, you know, Q-Tip and Busta Rhymes and Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock and Kwali and Mark Ronson and Fab Five Freddy and all of these luminaries of the culture and that it was surreal to be in the room and it was also surreal for me to walk into that room and already know half of the people <laughs> Um, which tells me I've been putting in work at this for a really long time. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's been a long road to get here. And, you know, from the time of the mixtapes, you, you certainly were encouraging me to try to make my own album. Um, you were probably the first person to really sort of see that and encourage me to do that. Um, so it's pretty surreal and amazing to, to be here right now in this moment, having made this thing that we've been talking about for so many years. Yeah, you know, it's like I, people don't understand that um, putting together a mixtape isn't just putting records together. You you do research. And I think the thing that really uh, s stood out for me when it comes to you is you could hear the level of detail that you put into these mixtapes. You could hear the level of research. It wasn't just, I'm going to grab a collection of songs of said artists. It was the way that it was intertwined, you know, uh, uh, with who the person was mm -hmm. and you know just putting it together is a big thing and that was something that i think i looked at and i said if he can put together a mixtape um like this i'm curious to see what he would put together when it comes to his own project so. yeah and honestly I, I think for me just you know growing up stories were a big part of my life i felt like everything was conveyed as a story um the lessons i learned all came in story form you know i remember my dad reading stories to me mm -hmm. and then the other side of it was music was constantly around um you know my father was actually a folk musician he wrote music mm. everything was a song when i was a kid so i think i made these connections in my mind between you know sort of events and songs already and then, you know, the stories were the way to kind of convey the message and the idea. And it wasn't as if I set out to mix these things together. You know, there's this moment I've told the story before of sitting in um, this listening session for Godson for Nas. Mm. And, you know, he had just, um, you know, Ether had just happened and he was really feeling himself and he just starts telling these stories. And um, there's a bunch of college radio DJs. Um, I was not a college radio DJ. I was just in the room. My man G Brown like couldn't go, and he's like, <laughs> "Here you go." And and it was while I was sitting there he listening to these stories that I thought how ill it would be to mix the stories with the music and just give a fuller picture of what it could be. And I, you know, I put my mini disc down and I recorded it. And afterwards, I went up and I just got a drop from him. Like, y'all have this idea, you know? Can you co-sign it and give me a drop? And it was all still an experiment, you know, at that point in time. And when I made this thing, um, I, I didn't know how to combine these things. And I think early on, I was more tentative. I would put only a little bit of the interview. And, you know, it was mostly about the music. But what happened was, you know, these things just started to take off for me. And, you know, Nas was a favorite of mine. And, you know, this was about me sort of telling the stories of and learning the stories of, like you said, my heroes, you know, it was Big Daddy Kane. It was, you know, Lauren Hill was the next. And I felt when I when I got to the Lauren Hill part, there's this other element of there's a, a, a story sort of like a, a, a wrong story, you know, like that's out there and, you know, being told about her. Mm. And I wanted to correct that story and, and tell the story of this artist that, you know, spoke to me through her music. And that's kind of how this idea started to take shape where it was like I wanted to share what I felt was the story I heard in the music with the world but give it some context to to make it clearer you know that that mm -hmm. this was the intent of this work and what's been so amazing to me is that I feel like as a fan I'm so keyed into what the intent is because I can feel it in the music and that somehow or another that speaks to me 
in, in such a profound way that when I spit that story back, it speaks to them. Mm, so when I yeah. play my Lauren Hill mixtape for Lauren Hill, although I find out about it through like a side door of her brother telling me this, it's apparently in her CD player in the kitchen for three months, and it's all she's listening to. Wow. And she hears herself in it. And, you know, that's like the most gratifying thing possible for me. And, and then it's, you know, when I, when I see Q-Tip, and he'll hold up the Lauren Hill tape, and he's like, you know, can you do this for me? And little does he know that, like, I've been making that mixtape in my mind <laughs> <laughs> my whole life. Yeah, yeah. And, and so then it turns into a thing of... I know the questions to ask when I sit down to talk to him because it's the questions every fan wants to know. Like, what is Kapelka? Like, t you know, like, can you please tell us? <laughs> you know, or, or just sort of how did these things come to be? And, you know, it was this thing where I don't think anybody knew when they would sit down to talk to me how deep the conversation would go. So Tip would be like, you know, I'll give you 15 minutes and, you know, two hours Absolutely. goes by. That's how it goes. Yeah, and, and, and in those conversations, these jewels would be uncovered. So then you get to the point where just my enthusiasm as a fan of this music leads to, you know, a situation where he's explaining that, you know, Jades Don't Walk Away, you know, is the, is the baseline foundation of a war tour. Yeah. And then Questlove hears that, and he never knew that. You know, so that then says to him, well, who is this guy, J period, that's, you know, able to do this? And that's kind of been the, the story. <laughs> but, you know, like my story through all of that is sort of like, I'm absorbing these stories from these artists and, and maybe in the purest way possible because I, I didn't have access. I, all I had was the music. Mm. So like for people that tell me you need you know, access to this or that, like my story is a testament to the fact that that's not true. It's like there's, th there's a certain kind of artist that puts themselves into their music and I think there's a certain kind of fan that receives that and really, really gets it. Yeah. And, and I was definitely one of those fans. So, you know, to, to put that back into it and then now sort of be, you know, embraced by the culture, you know, and, and, and be in the room with those guys and, and have it not be unusual. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like that's that's a thing. It's it's pretty a, uh, incredible thing for me. So now we are at Story to Tell. Uh, this is your first um, official project. Um, was it easy? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the, uh, listen, that's the trick question. You asked that question <laughs> and we can go deep. Yeah. Was I mean, it I, easy? I, I think nothing great ever is, you know, and, and, and to be honest, like I come from a background having nothing to do with music, which is like, you know, don't, don't, don't hurt your arm patting yourself on the back. You know, like you can always do it better. You know, it was like, you know, in, in school, it was like you, you bring home an A minus and it's why, you know, why don't you get an A? And, <laughs> and so I think there's like a thing in me always of like going after the challenging things. And so I felt like the first thing was for me to figure out how to do this. You know, that comes from being around and watching and learning and, you know, even like going from mixing records to taking the vocal from a record and mixing it with another beat and finding marriages there and learning about how that works and then, you know, take the beat away and maybe I'm making the beat for that acapella and so you know little by little I started to you know experiment with production and more in a DJ sense I guess in the beginning and then you know what happened was you know I really I came here and I, and I got a, a different sort of perspective on how music is made you know in in my mind it's like a guy in a room with an NPC <laughs> and, I, and I think my early attempts was you know me in a room with an NPC and you know, when I'm by myself, like I was joking earlier, like I'll make Mob Deep, you know, my best approximation <laughs> of Mob Deep beats because that's what I love the most. Um, that's also not really where I'm from or my story. Yeah, so yeah. it just, you know, it spoke to me. Um, Lin Manuel actually, in, a, in an interview I did with him um, for, you know, it, this project made this in incredible observation to me where he was talking about Mob Deep and saying how they tell their story so specifically that it becomes universal. And I thought that was just a really interesting thought because, like, I'm not from where Mob Deep is from, but there's something in that music, yep. you know, that spoke to me. And so, you know, that was my first attempt at this. And then I came here and, you know, and it's Tall Black Guy and Stro Elliott and Daniel <laughs> Crawford. And I'm just like, I've got a lot of work to do. So I really I went back to the drawing board and, and I went back to the drawing board probably five times. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because every year I would come here and I felt like my stuff was a little bit closer to where I wanted it, but not quite there. 
And, um, and it became, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. And, you know, then I just started, you know, following that, that playlist retreat sort of, you know, mantra of, of, you know, being inspired by these guys, being motivated by these guys, and then wanting to collaborate with these guys. And that's sort of how I was able to create this project. It's, it was really a collaborative effort. And I think I was, I was deliberate and intentional about that because I felt like when I would do these interviews with, you know, greats like Q-Tip or otherwise, and they would talk about, you know, what we call the golden era, where we feel like the best hip hop came from, that it, it wasn't a matter of timing or anything else. It was, a, it was a matter of all these guys being in the room together mm -hmm. and having fun together. And then that's what made the music fun. So I was like, well, that makes all the sense in the world. So I just started trying to replicate that. And, um, you know, in some cases, like with the first single, All In Your Head, you know, that actually originated here mm -hmm. as a challenge track, which is, you know, maybe, you know, you can explain to people, but the most collaborative thing I've ever been a part of, because it's like, okay, you four, you go work together and figure it out. <laughs> and you have 24 hours. Yeah, and, and you know what's funny? Uh, my wife and I laugh because when that song was being created, it was uh, probably about three o'clock, four o'clock, <laughs> and um, the Tiffany Goucher vocal run at the end was playing on a loop, and that kind of really was burned into our memory banks um, for hours to the point that we woke up the next morning singing it and didn't know where we got it from. <laughs> and then when we played all of the challenge tracks and that track came on, there was a level of excitement that we had because it was almost kind of like, we were there when they made that, you know? Yeah, and I, I think also, you know, there wasn't really a formula or a plan for these songs we made to, to come out in, in the world. But, we, you know, what happened was, you know, while I was working on this project and, and honestly running into a wall, you know, over and over again and just trying to get better. And, and mind you, you know, me trying to get better is I'll go sit with Young Guru and I'll watch him work. I'll go sit with Rants from, you know, 1500, DJ Khalil, Omas Keith, like, you know, all these guys, you know, Blue, who was my engineer on the album, just sitting and watching and learning and trying to improve, you know, mm -hmm. sonically and, and otherwise, and then doing that same thing with, with other producers and musicians and, and so forth. But, but just this thing that, that happened where over the course of me trying to overcome the challenges, this song, All In Your Head, was in my head mm -hmm. and became my mantra. And, you know, what, you know, Tiffany Goucher is singing about is sort of, you know, trying to get past your fears and your doubts and that, you know, it's all in your head, you know, and don't let it get to you. That's, you know, what she's singing about. And that became this thing for me of like, you know, don't give in to the sort of the fear that you can't do this impossible thing. Go after the impossible thing and try and make it possible. And, you know, in the song, it sort of flips from, you know, her telling you to, you know, to push through those fears to this other side of it, which is, that your dreams, your imagination, those things are all in your head as well. And so, you know, like that's the thing that, that you know, allows the thing to take flight mm -hmm. and become something special. So, you know, that song really became the mantra for me overcoming challenges of my own. And, um, you know, my hope is that, you know, when it, you know, as it comes out into the world, that other people will, will hear that in it as well. And, and I think that'll be a really amazing thing to imagine that this track that we created here without any intention um, really, you know, was so pure that, that it survived through this whole process and became this, you know, anthem really for me personally and hopefully for, for other people when they hear it. So um, it, it, it is an incredible story of sort of overcoming challenges. And, um, you know, I, I laugh at the fact that when you're, when you're sitting here now to people watching, it, it looks like it's fully formed and it's easy. And, you know, and I, and I know from talking to you, you know, just as you know from talking to me, um, that it's not easy. And people would think, you know, maybe that it's easy to be Jazzy Jeff or, or what have you. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's also something that's been really interesting to me is, is, is the higher I climb on the ladder, so to speak, the more I realize that everyone's experience is the same in trying to get there. And, and it's pretty amazing, you know, everyone had to overcome challenges of one kind or another to get to that point. And, you know, not that I'm at the end of the journey, this is the beginning, but I do feel like I've come a long way to be here now, you know, with an, an album talking to you, so. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you really sit and think about it, um, 
uh, I, I had the, the pleasure of sitting with Quincy Jones and was able to ask him a bunch of questions. Um, what is actually a producer? And his, his answer um, has always stayed with me that he was like a producer is the person who puts the puzzle together. That if someone dumps puzzle pieces on the table and you ask 10 people in a room to pick up a piece and you tell them where to put it, who actually put the puzzle together? And he was like, you put the puzzle together, you just use other people's hands. Mm. And you know, we, we, you know, we come from a culture that everyone thinks that the person who actually made the beat is the producer, and it's really the person who put the puzzle together. Um, and that was something that you could tell from these mixtapes, that you were very good at putting a puzzle together so it was just kind of like, man, I can't wait to hear, you know, what he's going to do when he gets to the point that he can put the puzzle together of his own project. Yeah, and I think what, what's also for me interesting is that, you know, all the puzzles I put together before, the, the pieces were found and fully formed. <laughs> and this is the yeah. first thing, the first puzzle I ever had to put together where I had to make the puzzle you pieces You had to make the first. pieces, yeah. yeah. And, and that by itself is a crazy thing because, you know, I normally envision the whole arc of the story before I start, and this time I envisioned the whole arc of the story, and I was completely wrong <laughs> about the arc of the story, and that in actuality the arc of the story couldn't be formed until these pieces were made, and every time I went in pursuit of one thing, I found my way to another in, in, in terms of like trying to make one kind of record, putting people in the room, you end up making a different kind of record. Mm -hmm. And you know, part of that is just super organic in, in terms of the feeling of the moment and the and in the room, and then the surprise is that somehow that moment, you know, speaks to you in a way that that becomes one of those puzzle pieces. And um, I think I couldn't do what I was comfortable doing until I did the part that I was not comfortable doing. It's like I couldn't put the story together until I I, I first made these puzzle pieces and and uh, figured out you know, what that was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's really a part of of creating something from scratch that um, before you can build the house, you have to make the wood. <laughs> and, and you know, people don't understand that, hmm. you know, that's a process all in its own. You know, I'm pretty sure, you know, like you said, you've gone into the studio with an idea of something and came out of the studio and it was absolutely nothing of which you you thought you were going to go in and do and how do you build all of that together how do you not get discouraged how do you understand to let the creative process you know find its way you know through you know through all of this so yeah and i, I think you were one of the first people to really kind of encourage me to do this also because you saw that and also because you knew that that is real what a producer does um, i don't think i did know that you know when i started i thought the producer was the guy who makes mm -hmm. the beats and I, I always, um, you know, in, in French, the word for producer is actually is realisateur, which means the person who makes it real. So mm, it's like the one who go. makes it real. And that's like echoing that same kind of idea. And, and I felt like that's what I do. But I didn't know that in order to make an album that I could do that and, and it would turn into an album like it has. But, um, you know, sure enough, he here we are. So story to tell. Um, it is in chapters. Can you explain the chapters and how many chapters and how many songs are in the chapters? Well, um, I mean, the, the album as, as it comes out this year is going to be three chapters. Um, and, um, I have a fourth chapter, although I don't know if it's going to be part of this or, or something entirely of its own. Um, but that was something that came out of a lot of conversations, um, and just a lot of thought, um, you know, I, I think people don't necessarily consider listening habits when they're making music, but I'm somebody who thinks about, you know, how people are going to digest this music. And, and I felt like the world right now is, you know, sort of a short form world when it comes to music. It's, it's all about singles and, and, you know, albums, long play things are not necessarily the thing. But I feel like for me, music is an experience. Mm -hmm. And it and it's and it is a world that I would go into. You know, you go into De La Soul is Dead, and you're in that universe. Yeah, you know, yeah. like that's the thing that was, you know, what caught me. I guess you know when I was younger is that it felt like it took me to this other world, and so I wanted to create a world in that way. But you know, my way of doing that was to sort of 
turn it into a storybook. And, you know, I came up off of, you know, book and record sets mm -hmm. where it was literally like, you know, turn the page, you know, the next part of the story and read along. And so there was that in the back of my mind and I wanted to make that. Um, and then this idea of breaking it out into chapters, I felt like, well, OK, so maybe if the world is how it is, I can take this big, long form story, break it down into parts and then give it to you chapter by chapter. So it's almost like and that's why there's a teaser at the end of every mm. chapter for the next chapter it's like a cliffhanger in that way and the whole thing is eventually going to add up to a full-fledged excuse me a full-fledged book and record set so um you know dan lish who's you know an incredible artist mm -hmm. who I, I i discovered um last uh, maybe a, about two years ago i discovered him first i walked into a gallery and um there was a hip-hop show a native tongues art show and he had these two pieces up, uh, a, a De La Soul painting and a Tribe Called Quest painting. And the second I saw it, I was like, who is that? Yeah. And um, I was introduced to him and then I ended up um, sort of connecting with him and, and he did the art for my Outcast mixtape and it was sort of this like Mad Hatter kind of crazy mm -hmm. thing. Um, and then again, you know, we did another one and then when the, um, when the quarantine came around, um, and again, you know, shout to you for being the person to encourage me <laughs> to get on my live stream yeah. and, and do it. Um, I wanted each offering to be like its own little art project, you know. And so I, I had Dan do the art for all of the live mixtapes. And through the course of that, I started talking to him about this storybook idea and he loved it. And so, you know, what ended up happening is that Dan is not only the artist, you know, the cover artist, but he's doing a, a piece for every single song on oh, the project. Wow. And then um, that is going to turn into a hardbound book with vinyl, you know, all together. Um, and then that'll be kind of like the full ultimate version of, of the storybook when, you know, hopefully by summertime, <laughs> 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 the, the last of these is out. So, you know, I think the idea of a storybook and my album being a storybook couldn't happen without, you know, an artist that could really bring that to life. And Dan's drawings feel to me like my mixtapes do, where it's like there's a world there. Yeah. And and it and and all the little details and all the nuance, you know, one of the things that for the real heads that appears on the album are there's, you know, the little Easter eggs, so to speak, that are sprinkled throughout, references to things. And that's the thing for anyone that knows my mixtapes, I do a lot. Um, and I think it's to me one of the most hip hop things there is, mm -hmm. you know, like everybody was always referring to a thing in another song or, you know, yep. it's like there's like a there's a, an understanding there that um, I wanted to, to always put into the mixtapes. And um, I think that's also in Dan's art. So you see his art and there's little pearls that are like, oh, man, like that's the thing from that. And, and it all kind of helps tell that story. So I think. My storybook wouldn't be complete without without Dan Lish, so props to him. Yeah. So th how many songs in Chapter 1? Chapter 1 is three songs. Uh, chapter 2 is three songs. And ch excuse me, Chapter 3 is three songs plus a possible bonus track. Okay. Okay. So now I heard Chapter 1. <laughs> and you have some amazing guests on the very first single. Yes. Um, as soon as it comes on, you know, there was Mr. Dave Chappelle <laughs> and I had to put stop because I was kind of like, OK, how the hell did Jay period get Dave Chappelle on his first song? Uh, you want to you want to bring it up? And, yeah. And, yeah. Because I'm, so. I'm, I'm like, OK, so. Hello. This is Dave Chappelle. So first of all, <laughs> you don't start something off with hello this is Dave Chappelle. Like, that's cheating in itself. That's, that's, you got him. Hello. This is Dave Chappelle. Welcoming you to J Period Presents A Story to Tell. A musical journey in three acts. When you hear this sound, turn the page. Please. Tune your speakers for maximum bass response. That's a little tribe reference. And enjoy the show. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, a story to tell. All right, all right. Good, good. <laughs> How did you get Dave Chappelle? Well, Jeff, I've got a story to tell you. <laughs> um, 
you know, it, it's, I think one of the, the magical things about this project is how many stories there are behind all of the records. Um, some of the songs are stories themselves, and some of them just have incredible origin stories. Um, but the story of how I got Dave Chappelle on the album um, begins about two years ago when I'm in L.A., and um, I'm going to see Jirobi and, uh, from A Tribe Called Quest. Um, and Jirobi says, you know, come over, I'm, I'm hanging out with Dave. And, I'm, and I don't know who Dave, he, which Dave he's talking <laughs> to. I'm like, all right. So I go over and come to find out it's Dave Chappelle. And, you know, as it happens, um, the night that, that I'm meeting Dave is the night before the Hamilton mixtape comes out, mm. which I'm sure we'll, we'll get back yeah, to yeah. Um, at a certain point in time. And so my introduction to Dave Chappelle is, Jerobi's like, this is Jay Period. He's going to have the number one album in America tomorrow. And so, you know, instantly Dave's ears perk up. And he's like, wait a second, Jay Period? I was like, yeah. He's like, you did my favorite Q-tip mixtape of all time. And I was like, I, I mean, <laughs> literally walked out of the room and came back into the room because well, how does that even happen? Yeah. And, and so, you know, he says that and Jerobi's like, oh, you guys should do a mixtape together. And I was like, yes, we should do a mixtape together. And, you know, that idea kind of floated in the air um, and he actually shouted me out from stage that night, which was amazing. Oh, wow. And then afterwards, he comes backstage, and he's like, Jay Period, you got your DJ stuff? I was like, yeah. He's like, good, you're DJing the after party. I was like, I guess I'm DJing the after party. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 I kill the after party. At the end of the night, he's like, all right, here's my number. You know, call me up. And for about a year, this hangs in the air of, of you know, we're going to do something, but I don't know what. And so over the course of this time, my album pieces start coming together, and I already know I want a narrator. You know, my first thought was Black Thought would be the narrator, which he, he ultimately kind of is uh -huh. in Black Thought form. But um, I had this idea of, of Dave being the narrator, and it was so far-fetched that I didn't even want to entertain the idea. But then I found myself, you know, last February at, at the Grammys, and, I, and I, I'm in a party with Dave Chappelle again. And, and I said to him, you know, I've got this idea um, how would you like to be the narrator of my, my storybook? And he's like, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, oh, just, like, just like that. And I was like, okay, great. You know, but again, you know, time goes on and, and nothing's really happening. And so during the middle of the pandemic um, last year, I'm talking to a, f a friend of mine, Mikkel, who used to work with, with Miss Lauren Hill, and, and she's in Yellow Springs with Dave and at this summer camp thing that everybody's heard about. And she's telling me I should come out there. And I'm like, nah, I haven't really traveled. I don't know. And then Questlove grabs the phone from her and is like, Jay Period, you need to come out here. There's kids here. You'll be safe. Come on. And I'm like, OK, Amir never steered me wrong before. Uh -huh. Let's go. And so I literally packed, as Tariq says in the verse, packed my family in the car and drove nine hours to Yellow Springs, Ohio, in search of this Dave Chappelle drop or whatever it was going to be and I literally didn't know what it was going to be but you know to my great amazement he was still really open to doing this and he did it and he and he recorded it and I went and I'm driving back and I was like I can't believe that just happened like I actually just got Dave Chappelle on the album and what's most crazy about that is where that's progressed since then yeah yeah, yeah. um is that now i've been invited back several times there's a project um which is sort of top secret now but might have been revealed by the time that you know uh this comes out that basically means that there's a a working relationship with him that's developing which is amazing to me and i'm just honestly blessed to have him be a part of it and you know i think if I'm going to tell a story, who better to narrate the story than the greatest, you know, comedic storyteller of our yep. generation? Yeah. So I figured we were off to a good start to have Dave be the first voice we hear. <laughs> the second voice is Black Thought. Yes, which indeed. you said you wanted him to be the narrator originally. And he was kind of like, if Dave is 1A... Black Thought is 1B. Like, how'd you pull that one off? Um, patience. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I love Tariq Trotter. I've been, you know, blessed to DJ for him for the last, you know, almost 10 years. And I think, you know, it's sort of a funny running joke um, amongst any DJs who DJ for artists that you would think that it's easy to get a verse out of that <laughs> artist, but in fact, it's the most difficult thing in the world because you're always right, you know, you're just right there. So it's like, oh, I got to do that first, but then, you know, then I'll get to you. 
And so I think, you know, I didn't know what to ask of him, and he's Tariq Trotter, so he can take the story anywhere. What I was originally asking of him on the verse is to talk about what Tiffany is talking about, which is sort of getting past your fears and, you know, pushing through. And what I got back was n not remotely close to what I asked for, <laughs> but was absolutely perfect. Yep. Yep. And, and it was basically Tariq Trotter telling the story of me going to Yellow Springs to get Dave Chappelle on the album. And mm. it just makes for this combination um, of, you know, titans, you know, really, yeah. to, to begin this project that I think establishes, you know, it's like the source used to say, put your best cut first. And, and I, I, I took that to heart. So it's like if, you know, on the mixtapes, I, I would use a similar principle where it was like smack you in the face right off the bat. And then, OK, we can take a step down and get into the story. So if you if you ever listen to the mixtapes, there's an arc to the story and it's always c catch your attention mm. first. And then it's like, you know, the blockbuster movie with the big opening scene and then they, they've got you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Lin-Manuel, not, not to get sidetracked, but Lin-Manuel told the story of, of the Hamilton mixtape how, you know, in his mind, it should, it should be different the way that it comes together. And in my mind, you put the first, the, the best two cuts first. And we disagreed about that. And he ended up sort of allowing me to do it my way. And later on was like, now I see. Because like, mm. you hit them once, you hit them twice, and they're yours for the next 60 minutes. Yep. And I feel like, you know, nobody, well, not to say nobody, but people don't know Jay Period as a producer. And so I think it was important to establish that this is going to be serious right from jump. And yep. so then, you know, you get Tariq Trotter. I don't know, you want to you wanna run the, the Trotter part? Yeah, well, here we go. <laughs> yeah, my brother Joel went to see Dave Chappelle amidst the pandemic. I said he brave as hell, blaze the trail. Just don't take a major L. I'ma wait, save the date, save yourselves. Next thing you know, he brings his things to Yellow Springs and says to spread his wings. It's been the stuff of dreams. Oh well, time to pull another book from the shelves. Feels like he got a story to tell. Well, I'm glad he didn't listen to what you wanted. <laughs> And he did his own thing because that was perfect. That was that was absolutely perfect. Yeah. You have someone else on, mm -hmm. uh, Tiffany Goucher. Yes. Who is a favorite, favorite person of mine mm -hmm. as well as an artist. Um, how did the Tiffany thing kind of come about? I mean, once again, you know, here we are at, at the home of the Playlist Retreat, you know, and all is owed to the Playlist <laughs> Retreat and, and to you for that introduction. Um, I think... You know, playlist is this magical sort of thing where you put, um, I think, kind of trailblazers, you know, together, and then these amazing connections happen, and these amazing ideas spark off from that, and and it becomes a thing where much of the project that I made is me trying to recreate the playlist energy mm. in a studio of you know those ideas of collaboration and just you know certain kind of people that I think are true to the art, it, it, it's, it's revealed to other people who are true to the art. And when that connection happens, really amazing things come out of it. So, you know, the story of Tiffany being on the track is that she and I just hit it off. You know, like we were just kicking it and hanging out and I got a good vibe from her, she got a good vibe from me. You know, we're from very different places, but again, somehow the energy that's cultivated here is a connection, you know, between people. And so, you know, the challenge comes where I'm paired off with, you know, Andres Matson from Moonchild mm -hmm. and Mel Starr, you know, Monster, who's doing the cuts on, on the track as well. And um, uh, Kaidi uh, Tatham, I don't even know if he was in our group. I think that Kaidi heard the, the, the sort of framework of my beat and we had done like a rough bass line and then Kaidi comes in, he's like, let me take care of that. <laughs> and, 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 and not to cut you off, yeah. but I heard Tiffany wasn't even in your group. Tiffany was not in my group. So it, it was, again, one of these things of, um, you know, we, I think also Damien was in, was in the group mm -hmm. as Damien well. Damien DeSandy. Yeah, Damien was in the group. Um, and, you know, Kaidi just came by and heard it and was like, okay, let me put this down. And then something about that connected and, um, you know, the drums were a sample of Steve McKee. Mm -hmm. And then I took a sample of my own from Stro Elliott, which I am prone to do very often. <laughs> um, shout out Stro. Yes, shout out Stro, who is the drummer in my band. Um, I just told him he doesn't ever have to show up because I already have all the drums. <laughs> um, 
So, you know, that was all happening. And then Tiffany walked by at, you know, maybe two in the morning and hears this groove going. It's like, ooh, like, is anyone singing on that? And I was like, nope. Like, <laughs> and she's like, can I get on? I was like, absolutely. So we sat in the sunroom, at, at, you know, at your house yeah. until, you know, five in the morning with the beat bumping through the wall and, and Lynette, you know, sort of dreaming about, about this record. Yes. Um, and, and we made it right there on the spot. And, and the truth is that the vocals and the track that we created that night, that is what the finished record came to be. It's just that you know, once it, it sort of entered this universe of story to tell, um, and, and like I said before, kind of helped me and became an anthem for me, that then putting Black Thought on it was, was something I, I wanted to do and I told Tiffany about, she's like, oh my God, yes. And then when I got Dave Chappelle and Black Thought on it with her, you know, that's like yeah. dream come true scenario. And it was my great sort of pleasure to to put her in that context because she is a fantastic yes. artist she's Absolutely. like a first listen right when you hear her voice who is that yes and it's yes. happened everywhere i play all in your head um including in yellow springs where you know I, I played it and again it's like one of these rooms where you know beth ann hardison is in there is you know like uh one of the founding sort of black models, super the original sort of supermodel, supermodel. Who, who brought Naomi Campbell up. Naomi Campbell was in the room. It's like all these people who are towering figures and they hear her voice and they're like, who's she? You know, like, what's that? Because she's just got one of those voices mm -hmm. that, that just penetrates. So I, I was really, really fortunate to, to have her, you know, get on that record and, and who would have known that it would turn into what it turned into. Yeah. But, you know, again, you know, here we are. I love it. I love it, man. So, uh, you know what? Hold on. Let me, I don't want to cheat everybody. Let's, let's listen to a little bit of Tiffany. It's taking me back. You keep going back and forth. Yeah. You know it's time for a change, don't you? If something has to change. Losing time, gotta stay focused. Because I'm losing time. You won't get far if you don't stay open. Listen, man, the, the, from top to bottom, that is an extremely well-rounded, well-produced, thought-out, good-feeling, good-vibe record, man, and I must commend you on that. And now I will go retire. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, look, I, you know, all, all I've ever wanted doing this is to, to win the respect of my, my, you know, my peers and, and, and you know, my elders, um, and so, you know, to hear that is, is pretty amazing. Um, and I, I, you know, I just, when we were listening, was thinking about sort of what Tiffany's talking about. And I, I pulled up the lyrics, but she says, you keep going back and forth. You know, it's time for a change, don't you? Losing time, got to stay focused. You won't get far if you don't stay open. And, and I think about how much of the mm. playlist energy is in those words. And, you know, and then she says, it's all in your head. Don't let it get to you. And then sort of when we shift, it's, you know, set yourself free. And it's sort of like you have to get past those things in order to set yourself 
free. And, and, you know, the other thing that happens sort of by coincidence or divine timing of putting this out now is that, you know, you've got a world that's been trapped inside their houses and, yeah. and trapped inside their heads for, for a year. And so, you know, I think that idea of reminding people like not to, to give in to that doubt and, and, you know, don't let it get to you. It's all in your head. And, and sort of that message, I think, is also really powerful, a, a really powerful part of this, you know, coming out now, sort of the way the world is right now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it is perfect timing. You know, timing is everything. I know, you know, I heard you say that um, you you this this project was pushed back a couple of times and you fought it and you realized that it was pushed back for a reason. Um, you know, and that's that's pretty much a part of it is, you know, people I think people get the end result and don't understand the journey to get to the end result. The end result, you know, it, it's almost like you you do an enormous amount of work to get to the beginning, mm -hmm. not to the end. You right. get once you release this, you know this. That's the start of it, but that's the start of it for everybody else. But the start of it for you happened a long time ago. Yeah, it, it is. It is pretty crazy, sort of, to think of the arc of this story. But um, you know, like I said, by the, by either you know coincidence or divine timing. You know, it's it's happened in this way and I can only, you know, hope that it's divine timing. It feels like, you know, it was written in this way where all of these elements of my life from, you know, my whole career, I feel like have come to bear on this. And I've been having that feeling a lot lately where things that I learned or, or rooms I found myself in and lessons I learned in those rooms have come to bear on this mm -hmm. project. And it's taught me a lot. And, you know, even this idea of of like a thing being fully formed, like I remember as a kid hearing, you know, Thriller and couldn't imagine taking the pieces of that apart, like as if someone made that. I yeah. felt like that thing was just a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, to hear you talk about Quincy Jones is like to say that Thriller is actually something that was sort of in his mind and in Michael Jackson's, obviously, but but in his mind and, and putting those pieces together is the thing that makes it real. And that's where I start to feel like, OK, maybe I am on the right path because here I am. And, and that's the thing I wanted most to do. And, and now I've done it by learning all these lessons, mm -hmm. you know, all along. Yeah. Yeah. Story to tell. So I'm going to start it like this. Chapter one. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. This is Jamel Hill reporting live from Rocksteady Park and one of New York City's most celebrated playground courts, where fans have gathered for a game certain to go down in basketball history. Playground legend, mixtape master, J. Period, versus multi-talented rising star, Masego, in a heated game of one-on-one. -on -one. Today's game promises to be a study in contrast, veteran versus rookie, fundamentals versus flash, family man versus ladies man, and a battle of the ages for on-court supremacy. I've seen it all, folks, but I have never seen anything quite like this. What a story to tell. So without further ado, let's go courtside for the action. I think we might have to tell that story right quick. So first of all, <laughs> once again, you start off with Jamel Hill. Yes. Who used to be on ESPN. Yes. Okay, I need to know that. Well, I mean, okay, so I, I mean, I, I probably should tell the story of how this basketball game originated yes, as well. Yes, because I was there. Yes, it, it, it is based on a real story. But, you know, I think that I can't tell the story of why it was sort of Jamel Hill was the right one until I ex sort of explain what happened. But basically, <laughs> um, for Globetrotting, which is the second song, um, you know, that originated out here on the basketball court at the Playlist Retreat also where, you know, there's a lot of a lot of battles that would take place. Yeah. And um, and, you know, no one ever um, sees me coming on the basketball court. <laughs> and then suddenly I start putting the jumpers up and they're like, OK, J period. And, you know, cross a couple people over. I, I believe there, there is someone I won't name names who yep. was renamed Passport, Passport because I crossed him over and his passport fell out of his pocket. <laughs> We're not going to say. We won't name names, but but he knows who he is. Um, so, you know, through the course of this, you know, Masego, who is out here, you know, amazing, young, talented artist. I mean, rapidly rising at this point in time mm -hmm. and, and just a guy who has 
you know, phenomenal energy, both musically and just as a person. Yes. And so, you know, Masego was, was sort of teaching some lessons on the court. And he was looking around for who he could teach his next lesson to. And he didn't realize that it was now time for me to teach him a lesson. <laughs> and so, you know, we stepped on the court and, and played, you know, a game of horse. And, and, and I beat him. He's like, all right, let's play again. You know, beat him again. He's like, all right, let's play again. And, you know, seven games later, <laughs> I, I, had, I had handily beaten Masego. And, you know, he didn't like all the trick shots and the over the backboard and whatnot. But, you know, that's that's that, hey, that's man, all, that's all a part of it. So, you know, what what was funny is that, you know, we went to went to bed that night and woke up the next day and 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 Masego comes over to me and he's like, I got something for you. <laughs> and, it, and it turns out that Masego had been so inspired by our game that he went and wrote a song about it. And, you know, the, the beauty of, of sort of narrative building as I'm doing you know, in that, I actually wrote that script for, for Jamel to read, and it's sort of building up this idea of me as one character versus Masego as another character mm -hmm. and all the differences between us. And so when Masego wrote, you know, his record, the narrative changed to Masego, you know, basically, you know, like making an example of me. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I thought it was amazing, and it was an amazing sort of song, you know, foundation of a song, but I felt like in order to make this a whole experience, I've got to respond to Masego and I'm not going to rap. So, you know, I then go and get a, a, another friend of mine um, who sh is Shad from yes. Toronto. Uh, amazingly hilarious and witty yes. and clever MC. And I'm like, OK, here's what's going to happen. Shad is going to be my, you know, rebuttal to Masego. And so Shad writes this verse, and it's sort of like, you know, basketball this and then basketball that. And I'm like, no, 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 Shad. I'm like, I don't want you to, to write like you were this person. I want you to be yes. this person, like the old man that steps on the court and just, like, totally throws everything off. Uncle Drew. Uncle Drew. There you go. I mean, that, that's definitely one of my inspirations. And so Shad is like, oh, you want me to embody that? I'm like, yes, like, I want you to be that. And so he wrote one of the most hilarious <laughs> verses I've, I've ever heard. And that became my, my retort to Masego. And so next step was, all right, well, if this is a real game, we need an announcer. And so the first round of it was me recording dummy vocals as the announcer, like doing my best Chick Hearn, um, which remains on the record. But I felt like if this was a real game, before we throw to the courtside, you know, reporter or the guy who's sitting, you know, at, at half court, we need the, the proper courtside yes. reporter. And I felt like, you know, Jamel Hill was the perfect choice because, for, I mean, for a number of reasons. One, you know, she is just a towering figure in the culture, I think, at this point in time. She's known mm -hmm. as a truth teller and, a, and, a, and she's a great storyteller as well. So I felt like that fit you know, in the realm of, of what I was trying to do. And, and then I also just thought it would be so funny to have almost like it was a spoof ESPN 30 for 30 um, <laughs> kind of thing where it's like she's telling the story of this legendary basketball game, which never actually happened, <laughs> but is, you know, is based on this real story. And she was a great sport. Um, and I met her at the Black Panther premiere. And again, it was one of these things where I, and I'm like, you know, Jay Period. And she's like, oh, my God. Jay Period, you do the live mixtape with Black Thought. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and, and she already kind of knew, uh, you know, from that standpoint. So she was into it. And she's a tremendous Black Thought fan. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, that, that became sort of, you know, the, the ask was, Jamel, I want you to be the reporter for this, you know, fake basketball game. And um, I don't even think she understood what it was until I put all the pieces together. But, you know, the story of this album, and I think in, you know, the next song we'll get into it a little bit more, but the story of this album is the story of me sort of like imagining the story and then going and finding people to sort of like casting it and mm -hmm. playing the roles and then writing the parts so that everything fits together in, in that way. And, you know, little subtle things like where she says, you know, story to tell, what a story to tell, yep. like all, all those little things to me are the things that make it feel cohesive and whole. And so I just I was really fortunate that she was she was down to do it. And yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it came out great. Listen, let's check it out. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here for an incredible matchup. On so the that's you. Of the court, we have that the is actually me. Flying, the young phenom, the globe trotting Masego. And on the other side of the court, the perennial all star, the one and only Jay period. So let's go to the court, folks. They got a problem, they gon' come to me. 
I got that answer like that number three. That boy don't ball, that boy can't ball, he weak. That's a fabrication. Leave all them tricks and things up in the streets. Globe try, lonely, crash talk, future lips. She says leave all those tricks and things up in the streets because that's what I beat them on. Lonely, crash talk, future lips. Go on here. Bang, bang. What a spectacular move there from you, Masego. This is truly a battle of the ages. On the one hand, the young phenom Masego is cutting, slashing, and taking the ball to the hole in spectacular fashion. On the other hand, Jay Period, the wily veteran, training jumpers from every corner of the court. Let's go back to the action, folks. I know you know you ain't gonna get this dub. I've been working for two, three summers, bruh. Don't make me hand you to the internet. Don't meme you up and push you out the door. That's Masego flexing his large following on social media. <laughs> right, pause it one second. So just before we get to Shad, I, I got to just tell one thing. So. You know, when I when I did the the scratch vocals, you know, for that, which I ended up refining and, and making the real vocals, it was only supposed to be a, a dummy track. It wasn't supposed to be me on there. But the funny story behind that is when I did the Hamilton mixtape at the beginning of Immigrants, there's a, a news reporter and I had sampled a Fox News reporter um, talking about immigration. And, you know, the record label was like, oh, we can't use that. So I was like, OK, well, maybe Lynn will will do the news reporter. And so I made a scratch track for the Hamilton mixtape and played it for Lynn. And I was like, okay, this is what I want you to say. He's like, oh, no, 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 that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ended up, my voice is on the Hamilton mixtape at the beginning of Immigrants. So you so, were like, hmm. <laughs> right, exactly. So um, I always like that idea of, you know, first like Hitchcock, how he'll just make little cameos in his stuff. And then also just sort of, again, sprinkling little little Easter eggs or whatever. Yeah in there so so now we get to the part of the song where my excuse for shad coming in is that you know I, i'm the old man so i get injured in the game and then and then my injury <laughs> sub is shad okay I'm at the court looking lame in these tearaways stretchy. Yeah, it's fair to say I carry weight but not weapons. I mean, I like my carrot cake marinade. Still, I can move like a pair of skates. Imagine a fat Derrick Rose. Hair like a black Larry David, but handle like Stefan. And I shoot it like Steph can with my left hand. Holding court in my sweatpants. Multiple sweatbands. Face full of sweat glands. And I got the best damn trash talk at the whole Y. I'm that old guy punky. You Wesley Snipes white man can't jump at you. True Uncle Drew when I pump this. You know I can't dunk, but I pump fake then under you. And what? Never been number two. I'm that dude that got every trick. Got an elbow on every pick. And yes, I call every foul. Every time you shoot, I call out heavy brick. Just to get in your head a bit. Head of y'all. Heggy said five foot ten with a post game. And I take up the whole lane. No shame. Tank top and a gold chain. I'm that Utah jazz meets cold train. Semi pro meets propane. Throw flames with the hoop my slow game. Looking like no game. Give me no game. And you know that I'm no lame. Future legend that's globe trotting, trash talking on the black top. I'm like a black stocking, so I don't really pass off. Then I just catch it and pop it. Your back off. So, yeah. First of all, we're not even gonna talk about how incredible that verse was. Yeah. But how did you meet Shad? Man, um, you know it's funny because again, in in the six degrees of separation, uh, you know, I met Shad because um, Decon. He was putting a record out with Decon. And they sent me the video for The Old Prince Still Lives at Home. Oh, wow. Which, for anybody who doesn't know, yeah. this is this spoof of the Fresh Prince, Prince of Bel Air, Bel -Air. Yeah. That, that Shad did, which is brilliant. Brilliant. And I don't even know how he did it so well. Like, it looks like it is all the same stuff. And so, you know, in that record, it's, it's just a hilarious song about him basically living at home with his mom. Like, he's like, you know, he's <laughs> like, I'm supposed to be this king, and, I, you know, and I'm still living at home. And so, you know, there's a humor in it and a, just a cleverness that's in that song that instantly I was like, oh, okay, I mess with this guy. I put him on the Rage's Back mixtape over um, uh, Big Daddy Came Raw, um, which is like, you know, you got to be a real MC yep, to yep. step to that beat, you know, at all. And, um, and then, of course, you know, with Six Degrees of, of Separation, 
Shad ends up at the playlist retreat. <laughs> and so the funny part of that is that Shad had already done the verse before he came to the playlist retreat for the first time. And that's when he got to meet Masego. Wow. So it just, again, was connected in this crazy way where, you know, a year, I think, had arced from the beginning of this, the story of that song, to the point where Shad puts his verse and then he ends up at the retreat. So, you know, Shad, I think at first, Masego didn't know who Shad was and it was kind of like, eh, what's this guy doing? And I, and I was like, just trust me. And sure enough, like, you know, then they connect and then Shad is here and it becomes this thing of, of this perfect marriage that who would have known until you hear them together. And, and honestly, that's one of the things I think that's been important to me about Story to Tell is that I'm combining artists together that wouldn't normally be together. And I think, you know, subtly that is also an ode to the playlist retreat mm -hmm. and this idea that you, you mix together amazing elements and something even more amazing comes out of it. And it, especially when it's something that you don't expect. So, you know, who would ever put Shad and Masego yeah, on a record? Yeah, you know, like, yeah. here I am. <laughs> so, you know, or who would put Tiffany and, you know, Black, Black Thought? Thought. You know, like, um, same thing. A and I think, uh, you know, on the third record as well, there's a sort of natural marriage that happens, you know, that makes it work, even though you wouldn't have expected it to work. And that trend continues through the other chapters, for sure. Okay. I want to I wanna get to the third record. It's called Grand Combo. I'm going to well, play. Maybe before you play this, play the end of, of Globetrotting, if okay. you can. Because okay. So there's one other character, while he's queuing this up, there's one other character who, who makes a cameo in Globetrotting, and that is Bobito Garcia. So, oh, you know, man. Bobito is not only one of the, the sort of most important cultural figures yes. in hip-hop, you know, Stretch and Bob and so forth, he's also a crazy sneakerhead. And um, he's also Puerto Rican, which will lead us into the next song. But first, this is Jamel Hill closing it out. battles I have ever witnessed. And a timely substitution bringing in Toronto's own Shad to close out the game. What a treat for this New York City crowd. And as you can hear, they cannot get enough of these two. Once again, Jamel Hill reporting live. And we'll see you on the court. Yeah, that one-on-one -on -one was bananas. I'm I was on the fence, like, playing the five-on-five five on the other court, and, yo, truthfully, I want to get like, yo, Masego, Jay Perry, I got next. Whoever wins, let me know. But Masego got a nice game, and Jay Perry got the geezer, a.k.a. the crowd pleaser. Like, old-school, traditional, fundamental style, but you know how he rocks. Work. Yo, I'm kind of thirst ball. There's a bodega right there on the corner, 97. Come on, let's, let's, let's hit this bodega. So, so yeah, so, so Bob, um, you know, also in terms of the layers of, of the story, you know, Bob is not only the person, the perfect glue, probably the only person that's the perfect glue to marry a hip hop song about basketball with a Puerto Rican salsa sample that's yeah, coming yeah, next. Yeah. But <laughs> Bob is also a very important figure for me as a DJ, because when I first came to New York and, you know, I saw really technically proficient DJs who were killing it. And I just was intimidated by how dope they were and how far I had to go. And I saw Bob, who, you know, wasn't necessarily you know, technically proficient like those guys, but his selection was so amazing. Yes. And I thought to myself, like, I can do that because, like, I know my music. And, and that was one of the, th the things that inspired me to really pursue DJing was seeing Bobito. So for me personally, just to put him in there on the album was, yeah. an, was an important thing. That's beautiful. Check out Grand Combo. Oh, shit. Cool about love. Que lo que, Lin, what's up, yo, B? What's up, Bob? My man, Lin Manuel, yo. Fuerte abrazo, mi hermano. <laughs> hey, yo, this is the bodega. <laughs> Real talk, when I was four years old, we used to get the 10 cents ices oh, in here. Oh, damn. That's <laughs> like way over here. Time out, time out. Ooh, that's my joy right there. Oh, yo, you kidding me? El Gran Combo? Yeah. Yo, you can't get more Boricua than that, yo. Wow, man. <laughs> I feel like I should get some plantain chips now or something. <laughs> Oh, you didn't even know about Afro Boricua music, right? I'm talking about bomba plena. This is music and rhythms that are centuries old. Come on, let him know. See, this is what I'm talking about. I hear music and it just makes me. Yo, yo, cucumber slice, slice, slice. Yo, what's up? I heard you were shooting ball at Rocksteady Park. I had to quick check you out. We gotta pause it right there. Listen, who was that? that I was... know, I know that was Bobito. Yes. And and Crazy Legs from Rocksteady Crew. So, you know, one of the original and, and, you know, sort of iconic, most iconic B-boys of all time. All time. And again, you know, 
before I sort of go back to, to the interlude, you know, Legs is somebody who really, you know, kind of helped support me in my early days. Like Rocksteady kind of welcomed me in. Q Unique from The Arsonist yeah. kind of brought me into that family. And they were the first ones to really kind of like embrace me, you know, in terms of hip hop culture. So again, it was sort of as like a nod to Rocksteady. The game, the basketball game, in the in the setting of the album, takes place at Rocksteady Park, mm, uptown. So okay. like that, that's a little you know jewel that's that's sprinkled in there. And then you know Bobito plays all of his ga his games like from that you know era at Rocksteady Park. That's like a thing. You know he calls it the goat, um, and that's the name of it. And then you know in addition to him kind of shouting out sort of the truth about my my basketball game you know just like <laughs> fundamentals and you know whatever you know then bob walks out into the streets of new york and the story kind of continues um and he walks down the streets of new york he's talking to maida del valle who's another you know a poet amazing poet but another sort of important figure for me um i met her on a deaf poetry tour in 2004 she's appeared on multiple mixtapes of mine the roots the john legend mixtape um rise up project you know she's also on and so the two of them are having a conversation um, as they walk away from the park. And then, you know, what happens is I imagine this scenario where they hear the record playing. Like sometimes you would, you know, yeah, coming out yeah. of a bodega and, it, and that record draws you in to the bodega. And then, you know, again, like, you know, all the Sonics sort of lessons I've got to, you know, how to filter that. So mm -hmm. it's like it's over there. And then, oh, suddenly the door opens and um, and then, you know, we're inside the bodega. And, you know, then I felt like it's also an opportunity for Bob to give a little history lesson about what we're hearing. And, um, you know, part of that is is echoing, you know, my experience. So I used to get records delivered all the time, you know, promo records when I, you know, when I lived in, in Fort Greene in Brooklyn. And I became really cool with the UPS driver. And, you know, UPS driver I would, I would give mixtapes to. And, you know, one time after giving him many mixtapes and he'd been running the mixtapes, he he's like here i want you to have this you know and he gives me this gran combo album mm. and he's like this is the most important my favorite music from the time i was a kid you know it's puerto rican salsa music and you know i heard this and i just was overwhelmed by how amazing it was and so i'd always wanted to take one of those samples and flip it yeah and it had been kind of you know there for many years and then this you know sort of idea transformed into well, okay, rather than, you know, just using the beat that I made out of the sample, I want to incorporate the sample, the original, into the story, and I want to make, you know, someone sort of tell people why it's part of the story. And so you get Bob giving this little cultural history lesson about Puerto Rican salsa and bomba and plena, like, you know, these, like, styles of music that I didn't even know about. And, and it becomes this little moment to do what I do on the mixtapes, which is just to give a little bit of context to what we're hearing. So it's all in the flow of this conversation. But the craziest part about that is, you know, maybe you can run it back. This conversation was not recorded together. Like I scripted out this conversation and everyone did their parts and then I put it together to make it sound like it was happening in real oh, time. Oh wow, hold on, let's run that back. Lin Manuel cameo. Hey yo, this is the bodega. <laughs> Real talk. When I was four years old, we used to get the ten cents ices oh, in here. Oh damn. That's like way over oh, here. Ooh, that's my joy right there. Yo, you kidding me? El gran combo. Yo, you can't get more boricua than that. Yo, wow, man. I feel like I should get some plantain chips now or something. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you didn't even know about Afro Boricua music, right? I'm talking about bomba plena. Yeah, this is music and rhythms that are centuries old. On, See, this is what I'm talking about. I hear music and it just makes me. Is that Lay? Yo, 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 what's up? I heard you were shooting ball at Rocksteady Park. I had to go check you out. That's what a producer does. Piece the puzzle together. That's That's amazing. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. So so it's basically that. And then that segues, you know, it's, you know, seamless on the on the record into the part where, um, you know, the sample opens up and becomes the hip hop version of the record. And that's where, you know, I, I gave this beat to Joel Ortiz mm. and um, Joel Ortiz and I were in the studio in Brooklyn, um, honestly, almost four years ago. So it's, it's amazing that his verse sounds like it could have been recorded yesterday wow. and is and is, you know, everything he's talking about. 
um, still relevant. And so, you know, Joel heard it, and I said I had this idea for a record that just pays tribute to Puerto Rico. And um, I had already done the Hamilton mixtape, so there was this dream scenario of getting Lynn on the record, but at that point, that was still a dream. And, you know, so I presented this idea to Joel, and Joel put down this verse, you know, wi which, which we should play, um, and that verse sort of inspired everything that followed. Wow. Yo, got that good combo joint? Yo, my dude, turn it up. Where am I? Turn that up, turn it up. Wait. Uh, uh. Got cool, motherfucker. I'm from an island in the Caribbean. 3.4 million Taino Indian children play in the sun, have fun and run silly and no shoes, chasing the Goki frog amphibian. How I wish that was real, but it's obviously different. $70 billion debt, the economy system. Much of my family back home is poverty stricken. And they think life here is hitting a lottery ticket. They don't know about police brutality whippings. They don't know my skin tone had me thrown in prison. They don't know gentrification as our neighborhood shifting. And immigrants build buildings they can't afford to live in. Let's not talk about the Donald stuff. It's like a long Disney movie watching all the questions Donald does. But what trumps everything is hustle and vision. So my updated kitchen's a product of not having a pot to visit. My new car it's synonymous to my driving ambition Well, those ashes remind me I earned it and nothing was given I give in for nothing, it's like I don't get enough of winning Trying to be triumphant, bring the trumpets in it <laughs> uh, I, think, I think we might have to pause it there for a second All right. Yo, Joel killed that one Yeah, Joel is a monster And, you know, again, you know, there's another thing that happens on this album Where it's not necessarily about the people that you would expect, like I said, and it's also not necessarily about the people that everyone else says are the best. This is the people that I hear and I go. think are the best. And Joel is one of those people. I mean, from the time I first heard him, I wanted to do a mixtape with him. I felt like the mixtape idea I had for him was basically to put him in the context of every era of hip hop because I felt like you could make an argument that he would have held up his own in, in every, every era. In every era. So, you know, so the craziest part about this story of this song is that from here Joel puts his verse down and I'm sitting on this track with just Joel on it and you know I I go you know to Tony Touch and I have this idea you know I'm like maybe think about Fat Joe or, you know don't really know what it's going to become but again in the studio the ne the day we recorded it Joel and I were both like yo if we could get Lynn like you know like, that would be <laughs> crazy because it's it's really like in his bag musically and you know come to find out Lynn Manuel, one of his favorite MCs, is Joel Ortiz. Wow! So when Lynn heard the beat, I you know I pitched it to him. He's like, "Oh, I love the beat. The beat sounds great." And it wasn't quite you know an opportunity to record. Then I sent it to him again with Joel on it. He's like, "Oh man, like now I've <laughs> got to do this. Let me find the time to do this." And I had to wait almost a year to get an opportunity but you know it was it was worth the wait yes <laughs> because you know never mind the fact that he's Lin-Manuel Miranda but again if we're telling my story we can't tell my story without telling the story of the Hamilton mixtape and so you know it's like my introduction to Lin was through the Hamilton mixtape and you know I, I told the story earlier um, about that introduction and it was basically that you know before Hamilton was Hamilton I got a call from from Riggs Morales at Atlantic Records um, to go and look at this play. And, um, you know, he had this idea. I had just done stuff with this Tupac Broadway musical. Um, and shout out to Saul Guy, who, you know, connected that, um, and Saul Williams, who, who starred in it. But basically, when I went to see Hamilton, I was blown away, obviously. And then I, I bought the, the soundtrack and I, I listened to the soundtrack on loop for, you know, six months. You know, the original idea for the Hamilton mixtape was J. Period take the cast recording and mix it with beats. So there's a demo of, you know, 10 dual commandments, which is <laughs> over 10 crack commandments. Um, you know, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll cut in a, a little bit of that. But, but basically, there's a, there's a demo of 10 dual commandments over 10 crack commandments. That got circulated at Atlantic Records, and they were like, okay, like, you know, well, let's do something with J. Period. The thing was that over the course of the next six months, Hamilton became Hamilton. Hamilton. And so by the time the idea comes back, it's Lynn wants to have Alicia Keys and Buster Rhymes and Nas and Black Thought and Sia and, you know, Kelly Clarkson and all these people do records because everyone else now had become enamored with Hamilton as well. And so, you know, when it comes back, 
it's it goes back to the roots you know because they had executive produced the cast album and they're like amir can you put together a mixtape and amir's like well you don't want me you want j period and so he basically sent them back to me which is uh, incredible and you know in order to orchestrate he's like come to electric lady studios where the roots were working on endgame and um, you know, Stro Elliott's in one room, and, and Salam Remy, and, and you know, all, all of these guys, Kareem Riggins are there. Um, and, and so what ends up happening is Amir Questlove calls up Lynn on FaceTime, and he hands me the phone, and he's like, here, you guys go work it out. And I was like, uh. <laughs> so, you know, I walk to the, to the lounge at Electric Lady, and I sit down, and I'm, I'm talking to Lynn on FaceTime, and... Um, and, and basically, he's like, look, the record label wants, you know, biggest artist first, second biggest artist second. And, you know, Lynn had his idea of how to put it together. And my idea was, well, let's make a mixtape. And so I sat in the corner of Electric Lady, you know, basically for 10 hours, you know, with headphones on. And I made the framework for the Hamilton mixtape and I sent it into the, the label. And by the following day, they were like, new plan, this is the plan. Mm. And so, you know, I kind of won that, that job by making this demo. And, you know, the Hamilton mixtape obviously becomes this juggernaut. And, you know, I get a number one Billboard album and, you know, <laughs> back to the Dave Chappelle story yeah, and yeah. like the connections that, that come out of it. And so I think I established myself, you know, sort of with Lynn in a way where I'm, I'm, I'm not that I'm fearless, but creatively speaking, I'm pretty fearless. Like if I feel like in my heart something is supposed to be a certain way, I'll fight for that thing. And one of the things I fought for was, you know, like we said before, those two tracks going up front. Yep. And I think I earned Lynn's respect by disagreeing with him and being right in that way of like, it should be like that. And he, and he came around and was like, y you were totally right. And so, you know, that all I think laid the groundwork for him to just respect me enough as an artist to even want to be a, a part of this. And I think that's where, you know, the mixtapes really laid the groundwork. It's like mm -hmm. the mixtapes established, you know, that, that I'm serious about this, that I understand this, that I, I love it. You know what I mean? Like really, like I think more than anything, the love that's in those mixtapes, that's the thing that people feel. Um, Cause I, I'm a fan first. Yep. And I think that then leads to this, you know, situation where Lynn is down to get on this, record i wait a year and the next thing you know here we go we got lin manuel uh. by the way those are joel's scratch vocals that i kept he's not actually saying anything it just sounded so dope i kept it I I'm from a long line of Latin music, multi hyphenist. When you grow up on dyke minutes, it's music all your life, and it's a lot of demon of demon. We'll say I'll keep this hatching the Yankee hat and playing keep away. I'll keep the way that all my plan as hard as I will as I mean. I went up in the telemundo, you'll the eat it, I call it a buena. The separate fridge in the bodega, cold presidente. She dub you bridge to the heights, let me wreck it. Dead in the middle of minimal visibility. I thread the filigree of all my lingual versatility. So come with me in my water, milk out of regalia. You take the puente with Tito, I'll take a cruise with Celia. In aventura with Romeo, ojalá que llueva, café con Juan y guerra, o que que cante mi tierra. You want a grand combo, you got the sweet and sour of me and Yawa. From then till now, it's New York and power. J. Period. Joel Ortiz with Yawa. This bodega is lit right now. Yo, that shit is all the way up. The windows round it. Gustavi, where you at? Lynn Miranda. And then legs and, and Bob at the end to carry us onto chapter two. So, you know, Lin, Lin's verse there, by the way, I, I just I pulled up. I have a, a photo of his lyric sheet and there's there's just some amazing stuff in there where he shouts out bomba and plena, which is what the, you know, Bobito is talking about. I mean, he's also obviously got the, you know, dead in the middle of minimal visibility. Yep. I thread the filigree of our bilingual versatility, which is a big pun yep. reference. And, you know, again, you know, a shout out to pun. And, and I think also there's a way in which this record is sort of like, 
you know, another dimension of the untold story of hip hop. Like Puerto Ricans are foundational yes, in yes. hip hop, and that story is rarely, if ever, told. So it's not my story, but it's an incredible story, and it's an untold story. So I felt like I wanted that in here, um, you know, part with what Bobito's talking about, and then with Lynn. And then, you know, there's also these other amazing lines where he says, you know, take the Puente with Tito, mm. Tito Puente, but I think Puente is way in Spanish. Um, take a cruise with Celia, Celia Cruz, and Aventura with Romeo. So Romeo is the you know singer from Aventura, and and then in the background he's doing all the ad libs for all those little yeah. little things, um, and then you know again you know shouts out Yawa is, is Joel Ortiz shouts him out at the end of it, and um, you know one of the other things that that's crazy about this is that in the verse uh, I think it's actually in the ad libs he shouts out the character from In the Heights. And In the Heights, as it happens, is coming out later this year. And um, it takes place, you know, in much of it in a bodega uptown. And so, you know, this song is like the marriage of all these things. Again, it's like I couldn't have scripted it like yeah, that. It's yeah. just following an instinct. And then it ends up leading to this place um, where, you know, Lin-Manuel and Joel Ortiz are together on a record like that. So... Listen, this has been absolutely amazing. Um, I think we should get together again. Yes. Because I'm excited for everybody to hear all three of these parts, but we have to spoon feed it. So I think <laughs> we should come back and give everybody uh, part two. Yeah, I think, you know, chapter two, I won't, I won't reveal any names necessarily mm, mm, yet. Mm, um, mm. You can hear at the end of chapter one, I have a, a little breadcrumb hold on let's give him some breadcrumbs chapter two <laughs> ladies and gentlemen welcome to club true where we always bring you the real i'm your host the silky smooth voice of calm and reason in this chaotic world welcoming you to a place of refuge music making their way to the stage right now ladies and gentlemen the one the only J period jazz junction. So the, the J period jazz junction is, is up next. But you know, in, in that, I, I think it's important to play that for a couple of reasons. One, because it gives me an opportunity to shout out Rance from 1500 or nothing, mm -hmm. and, and J Mo, who is playing guitar. Um, that is not a sample, that yes. is 1500 or nothing playing that 60s oh, jazz I love it. I love it. Um, sample, which, you know, which I, I used as a sample in the song. And then Garth Trinidad, um, who famously of KCRW yes, in LA yes. and Chocolate City, is the voice on that record. Um, and what he's saying is basically you know, that, that music you know, is a place of refuge, that it's a place where we can you know, escape. And I think it's like an end cap to the idea of, of all in your head and that, that whole idea that, you know, if you're having trouble breaking through, music is often, you know, one of the best things to help lift your spirits and, mm -hmm. and give you the courage to, to do that. So, you know, for me, making this, having that playing, helped me, you know, continue to go. And I think in the same way, you know, people hearing it, um, I, I hope that's true. And, you know, that, that place of refuge that we leave it on is just a kind of like a last note on that of like how powerful music can be you know, if it conveys that, that feeling and, it, and if there's intent in it. So that is uh, chapter one of chapter a story to tell. One. Chapter one. Well, my brother, I am so excited to be doing this with you. Um, this is a full circle moment for me, um, especially from All In Your Head. Um, and I am excited for the rest of the world to experience um, this. We, we, we don't get these type of records anymore, mm -hmm. you know. I don't think people put the thought, you know, uh, for a cohesive project to tell a story, to take you on some level of a journey. I think a lot of the projects that we get now are just songs put together and you hope that you can piece your own story out of it. You know, listening to something that has a meaning and everything and all the rest of the, the, the the, the details of when it comes down to projects like this, I think is very important. So. Well, I, I got to say also, this is a, a full circle moment for me too, you know, not only because you are the person that taught me Ableton, you know, which is the, the, the <laughs> engine I use to make 
this, uh, you know, the, those first six weeks where I came down yep. to Delaware once a week and, and, and got lessons in it. Um, but just also, you know, full circle in the sense of being introduced to, you know, the Playlist Retreat and all the artists here and, you know, creating this thing that feels like the extension of that energy. And, you know, I'm, I'm obviously really excited for people to hear it. Um, all in Your Head is, is, is out, um, you know, available on all streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. We have an amazing lyric video that, that's um, animated by Elise Farrell. Um, my man Joe Vaccarino has done incredible animations of Dan Lish's art. Um, I got to shout out Ashley Fox and Dwight King, yeah. you know, Guy Rute, um, Farrell Monch, who have, you know, really yes. been invaluable yes. in giving me insights on this. And, you know, April 30th is chapter one dropping. Um, I'm very excited for that. And then, you know, shortly thereafter will be will be chapter two. But um, we got a lot of uh, a lot of awesome things that are coming to bring this to life. Um, Globe trotting is is going to get a, a comic book treatment, mm. um, you know, and uh, and might even take it back to sort of the book and record idea, you know, where I where I started, um, and you know, it's going to be over the next six months. These things are gonna, are going to be coming out. You know, I, anybody that's hearing and feeling like they're going to have to wait too long, you know, fear not. <laughs> it yeah. will it will all be coming out, and um, it's going to culminate in a really incredible place with the continuation of a story um, I started telling. Uh, a couple years ago um, about a letter I wrote to Wyclef when I was a kid. So I, I'll, le wow. I'll leave that hanging there. And um, in the meantime, you know, everybody, please go out and get Story to Tell Chapter One. Um, thank you for tuning in to this yes. as well. Um, I don't know where I'm looking, but I'm thanking everybody. <laughs> um, so, no, thank you for, for tuning in. And, um, yeah, you know, there's, there's more to come. This is only the beginning of the story. Um, so thank you, you know, Mr. Magnificent Jazzy yeah. Jeff for having me come through and do this. I couldn't think of any better way to, to kick this off. So I love it. I love right. it. Stay tuned for chapter two.